All right, here we are, another episode of Let the Be Talk. I'm fresh shaved. Look at that. Uh, a baby Dean with old neck. <laughs> and I got a great guest today. Eddie Bravo is here. Fucking jujitsu madman. What's happening? How you doing, man? <laughs> I'm good. How about you? Got your destruction shirt on? You know that, dog. German thrash scene, 1985, 86. Sodom, destruction, creator. You know how we do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think today's the anniversary, it is, of Kill Em All. Kill Em All Metallica? Yeah. It got released today, 1982? Uh, let me look, actually. Hold on. I think it's... 80, it's 81, 82, maybe 83. Yeah, you know, it's tough because it's like a blur, but let me look real quick. Um, and, you know, it's funny because uh, when you think about it, okay, here we go. Uh, 40 years, oh, it turns 40 today, dude. So that must be 83, right? That's crazy, yeah, 83. I was a junior in high school. How old were you? 83, I was 13. I was uh, at seventh grade, eighth, eighth grade, maybe. Eighth grade. I remember when I first heard Metallica. It wasn't Kill Em All. The first time I heard Metallica was Ride the Lightning, and it was Creeping Death. Oh. That was the first fucking song I heard. And that fucking left an impression on me, dog. That, that one crushed me. And uh, I'll never forget that shit. Next day at work, I used to work at a swap and selling underwear with all these other little Mexican kids trying to make, you know, 20 bucks a day. And I remember thinking, I remember I told my friend Javi, I said, uh, I think Metallica might be the best band ever. I mean, Creeping Death just crushes that middle part. We talked about that shit, right? We talked yeah. about that middle. Part. Yeah. It's so it, it, good. I actually remixed it, never finished it, but I took that middle part that da 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 bum bum bum. I I uh, sampled that and made it a a rap beat, but I never ever finished it. I never. It's uh, I'm gonna eventually finish it eventually. But man, that middle part as a rap song, like a violent rap song, works. <laughs> I just never finished it. It's wild to think about Metallica forty years the uh anniversary of that record i i got to open for them in san francisco on the 40 year anniversary last year so you know they had a record out one year into their career basically but it's it's wild to think about like to me if you take you go okay you go um you, you know you go all the records up to say justice. Cause a lot of people will talk shit about the black album, which is dumb. I love the black album, you know, but I think that the ride the lightning is be is a better record, you know, a better record than what? Then, then fucking kill them all. It, oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. I love kill them all. A lot of great shit. Metal militia. Yeah, uh, seek, seek and destroy. There, I hit the lights. There's a lot of great shit on Kill 'Em All, but uh, Ride the Lightning was like, um, like an epic, professional, evolved, blossoming version of Metallica. They went from Kill 'Em All to like all of a sudden Ride the fucking Lightning. Are you kidding me? Fight fire with fire. All yeah. that uh, for who for whom the bell tolls trapped under ice for whom the bell tolls no one ever gets tired of that song you yeah. never get tired I can hear that song forever I never get tired for whom the bell that's a fucking masterpiece it's wild the depth of that you know just in like a kind of a one year period uh, you know if you think about in a comedy type of situation if you see somebody and you see him one year. And then you see them a, a year later. It's very rare that they have that big of a jump in depth of their jokes and their stage skills and everything. But when you look at Metallica from Kill 'Em All to Ride the Lightning, the depth of the songwriting is completely fucking way different and way better. 
And it just it sounds way more original. I mean, you know, Kill 'em All is pretty original because it's thrash metal, but the the tunes on Lightning are just crazy to me. It's it's like each record you're like. You know, there's no comedian where each year they were like a million times better. You're like, holy shit. Yeah, that doesn't that that doesn't really happen in music either. Generally in rock, first album is the best because you had like your whole life to work on right. that shit. You had your whole life to work it out. And then they, then there's that sophomore jinx that everyone talks about where the second album wasn't that good, maybe has a couple good songs, and then they kind of fade. That's a, the general course of rock bands. Very few bands got better as they went along, and Metallica did. And I think I think it's because it was a, it was slow, because from from Kill 'Em All to Ride the Lightning to Master of Puppets to Injustice for All, that was a slow grind. They didn't blow up that quick because I remember um, the second album, Ride the Lightning. They played the Hollywood Palladium and they sold it out. It was like overflowing. But that's still just the Hollywood Palladium. That's what is that, 3,000 people? Yeah. But it was it was a sign of things coming because they were a speed metal or whatever you, you, you want to call them, power metal. They were above everybody else as far as heaviness and speed generally. I mean, except for Slayer and shit. But for the mainstream, they were so hardcore and to like just have this rumbling at Ride the Lightning. And then Master of Puppets, they opened for Ozzy. So in the beginning of that, so they it was like a slow grind. You know, they kept, it was so slow that I think their level of appreciation for their success was uh, huge in writing new songs. Because they were still, they, were, they didn't get it all at once. So they were still happy, like little increments. And they were appreciating life. So all that magic just kept coming out. I mean, damn, they did they did like five albums with just monsters, you know? I mean, uh, Reload, uh, I Love Mama Said. I know that's a country song, but I love Mama Said. But overall, um, you know, like Load was uh, considered like, oh shit, they cut their hair, they sold out. But yeah, you could think whatever you want. Bands change, people change. Um, I was, you know, I was right in there too. I, I, I thought like I was that guy that thought the Black Album was a sellout. I was. I was 21 years old. I was stupid. You know what I mean? Uh, I remember uh, the rumors coming out about, you know, uh, the new Metallic album. It's gonna they're selling out. And I'm like, no, no, no. And my buddy James called me up and he had to listen to Enter Sandman. And I said, what the fuck does it sound like? He goes, he goes it sounds like ACDC, dog. And I was like, oh, no. So initially, I wasn't in the uh, Enter Sandman, wasn't in the Black Album. I was like, okay, they sold out. I was one of those guys. I was young and dumb. I was one of those guys. But I remember hearing Sad But True at FM Station uh, before before a Kiss cover band that Tommy Thayer was playing. Ace oh, yeah. Kiss cover band, FM Station. And... Paul Stanley and Gene Simmons were there. That's another story. Yeah. But I remember in between, like waiting for this Kiss cover band to come on. Sad, they played Sad But True. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? Because I didn't even give the Black Album a chance. I heard Enter Sandman. I'm like, okay, they sold out. And then I heard uh, Sad But True and I was just blown away. And I had to go back. And I'm like, okay, this album is fucking amazing. Nothing else matters. Unforgiven. All that shit. You know, so... I was a kid. I was I, I was a victim of all that bullshit too, like thinking everybody sold out or whatever. Which people just trying new shit. You gotta yeah. accept it. But but if you're gonna try new shit, it better be good though. <laughs> you you can't experiment and have it suck. Okay, it's gotta be good. <laughs> hey man, I mean that's the the hardest part about comedy, you know, is you you have to experiment right in front of people, in front of their faces, and yeah. uh, you can see them go from. Uh, laughing to not laughing real fucking fast and then before you know it you're like oh no I gotta get this back it, you know that's wild it's it's almost like when you go you go see a band and they're like we're gonna play a new one and you go oh, I gotta go take a piss you know <laughs> totally, totally. I have no patience for new shit I'm, I'm guilty of that I have I'll, I, I like new shit but I always assume that no matter what band it is they could be my favorite band their new shit, I'm already gone. Mm, I'm like, no matter what, I'm never excited about 
new albums anymore at all. The last time I was excited about a new album, not maybe not the last time, but the time that comes up in my head, I'm a huge Queens Rag fan. Huge, oh, yeah. massive dude. Are you kidding? Warning. I mean, the EP, every song was good. The warning, every song is good. Uh, Rage for Horror, every song is amazing. Operation Mind Crime, every song is amazing. Like they didn't have bad songs. Like they were like, when are they gonna write a shitty song? And then uh, Empire came out and I didn't know anything about Empire, but I just knew it was like 91. And I remember seeing the video, they premiered it before the album came out, Empire, the title track, Empire, at my aunt's house. I used to live with my aunt when I, I, I was like, I think it was 1990, it was 1990, I was 20. And I saw the video, I'll never forget seeing the video of Empire and thinking, and being so blown away. I was like, oh my God, they're gonna keep it fucking going? Like Empire crushed me, the song. But when I got the album, that's when the cracks started forming. I'm like, damn, there's a couple songs on this motherfucker that ain't that good. Another rainy night, I was like, ooh. There was a song called Resistance, I'm like, ooh. I'm like, damn, they're writing some shit song. Even Best I Can. I was never a fan of Best I Can. I liked uh, um, The Thin Line. Uh, um, anybody listening? I didn't like Silent Lucidity. Lucidity. I thought that was a little too weak, but I get it. It was huge. It's the biggest hit. But um, Queen's right after that. Uh, then the next album was Promised Land. And that one, like, ooh, it was like two good songs on that one. And then after that, it was just no more Queen's right for me. <laughs> but they had a good run, dog. First five albums were insane. Oh, yeah, man. I fucking saw him open for uh, Dio on the Holy Diver tour on the EP. And man, oh, shit. he came out with Queen of the Reich. And oh. he hit those notes. And I was going like, well, you know, I was a singer in a band. I was like, what? How, how, how am I supposed to compete with that? You know, there's yeah. no fucking way. Yeah, his Crazy. vocals are insane. Dude, he, and... he sounds great right now. Yeah. Yeah, like uh, like um, like the whole warning album and the whole rage uh for order album, he's screaming this fucking ass off. He was screaming everywhere, even Operation Minecraft screaming. But then when Empire came out, he even made he came out and he told her he goes, "I'm not gonna be screaming that much anymore, dog. I'm gonna be singing some normal shit." He said that for Empire. He goes, "We're gonna do. We're, I'm not. I can't be screaming my whole fucking life." So he started doing a lot of mid range shit. And it kind of disappointed a lot. Of, uh, disappointed a lot of the hardcore Queens Rag fans, but I love him to death. I just saw him at the, the Rainbow. Were you there at the Rainbow when when uh, Queens Rag and Lizzie Borden were there? The you mean the outdoor parking lot show? Yes. No, no, but uh, you know Lizzie Borden. Uh, I, I did like that live record, live at the Country Club. Give him the axe. That shit was crazy. Yeah. You know, murderous metal show. You know, it's crazy. I'm a big gigantic Lizzie Borden fan. I loved all that high singing because Lizzie Borden sang similar to Jeff Tate and Ralph yeah. Alpert. He was screaming his ass off. So I was a big, big fan of Lizzie Borden. And you know what the trip is like, we're friends now, dog. And not only are we friends, but I took one of uh, his ballads. This was off um, Master of Disguise, 1989. There's a song called uh, um, Waiting in the Wings. It's a ballad. Fucking love that ballad. One of the greatest metal ballads ever. And I took that song and I remixed it into like a, a real like a fast rocking, like um, like uh, Queens of the Stone Age type tempo, just just a rocking song. And I remix and he fucking sang on. It. He resang the vocals. Wow, it's crazy. I'm like I'm like I, like I have him in the studio and like my idols like singing. He's like ah. It's like, what the fuck? How do we do this? And then he ended up putting the album, that I, the, the song that I remixed on his new album. I'm like, holy shit. So uh, that was fucking, um, uh, what do you call that? A fanboy moment? That's one of the greatest fanboy moments like ever. It's circle. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. I know you hang out with all sorts of goddamn rock stars, but for me, I only got, I only got like three or four that I know, you know what I mean? You know fucking everybody. Well, you fucking like you hang out with James Anthony. It's crazy. It's uh, I mean, you know, uh, I I grew up around that, and so did you. You played music, you know, and and just it was my life up until comedy. It was all I cared about: playing music, 
going to a show, making records, uh, recording, writing, everything. And now I'm straight comedy, you know, with an occasional concert here. And I'm the same way with comedy. I just like, ah, oh, fucking just dive in full on, you know, but when, when I was young, yeah, you know, it was, uh, is what I did. And I hung around people and I got very lucky because over the years I've had them on the podcast, which is really amazing. Like a Kirk Hammett or, or a Paul Stanley or a Gene Simmons or, or Lizzie Borden. I had Lizzie Borden on, he was sitting in my apartment in New York city. And I was like, I hadn't seen Lizzie Borden, what he looked like since that fucking live DVD and, and record. He had blonde, yeah. crazy hair and, you know, and yeah. there it was with like black hair and it was straight now instead of curly, like Sammy Hagar hair. And <laughs> he was on my couch. And for a few minutes, I was like, I, I hope this is him. You know, like, I hope I'm not getting punked. You know what I mean? For real. You, you know what? Uh, I, we have mutual friends, Lizzie Borden and I, and, you know, we would watch you. He's a big MMA fan huge MMA fan, Lizzie Borden. So he would go to these UFC parties that I would go to in the Valley. Um, uh, At Scotty's? Slammy. Yeah, they, Scotty. I don't know. You know who Slammy is? Slammy yeah, in the Scotty. Valley. Oh, you know Scotty? Yeah, yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah, that's my boy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and so Greg, Lizzie Borden don't forget would about go to his Greg. house and watch the UFCs. And I would go because, you know, Danny Loner from Nine Snails, that's my boy. Yeah. And uh, Bill, Billy Howard, oh, that's my boy. But like, that's how I met Lizzie I said, at these UFC parties. And we just started hanging out and chilling. It was crazy. I'm like, holy shit. I was all starstruck and fanboying out. Don't forget about Rockline Greg. Oh, yeah. Are you kidding? Greg's my boy. Yeah, yeah we're, I'm on a group text with Greg, Slammy, and Danny Loner. And basically, that group text is just like all weird kiss shit. Yeah. <laughs> it's just weird kiss shit. You know, Vinnie Vincent is spotted oh, yeah. somewhere. I finally got the, uh, yesterday I scored, uh, you know, um, I scored the mint condition Paul Stanley buckle. So now I just need Peter. I've got Gene, Ace, and uh, Paul, and they're all mint. And I, I'm going to uh, have Billy from Rock and Roll Relics build a custom box with glass and mount them and hang them on my wall. You know, the buckles. Like belt buckles? Yeah, you know, the kiss buckles. Dude, I had a kiss belt buckle, but it only said kiss on it. I, I oh, didn't have uh, the, I yeah. didn't have the separate ones. You had like a pulse. They're, they're, what is it? The solo album covers or what? Yeah, yeah, hold on, I'll show it to you right now. They're famous, dude. They're really rare. They came out in '77-ish or whatever. So here, they um, and they had four, and and they they're beautiful, dude. Here we go. Let me let me show you this. Here's the Paul one. Um, here, let me turn off my, uh, my backdrop because it will, uh, it won't show you, uh, okay, here, this is what they look like, dude. You gotta fucking, you gotta dig in, man, because these things are cool. Okay. Oh, hell yeah. Oh, damn. That's, that's not the solo album cover. That's like a whole different picture. I love it though. That's right, right, one. right. I don't know what the fuck. There we go. That one looks like, man, what era? That looks like, hmm. They made the it's buckles in 77. And uh, okay, they, so maybe it's like lo the love gun face, maybe, you know? They're, re they're really fucking cool, man. Um, hold on. Let me get my fucking uh, background back on. Let me talk to you a little bit about, since you were talking about MMA. Um, let's see here. There we go. I, it's funny to think about UFC. I look at UFC a lot like the X Games, where you think about the early days of the UFC, and you think about early days of stunt guys like Evil Knievel and shit. These guys didn't make the money that the UFC guys make now. You know what I mean? Think about the early first five years of like Gracie, uh, Tank Abbott, um, Shamrock, all of these guys, and it was early outlaw. And now the money that's made, just like Evil Knievel, 
People think that Evil Knievel was a gazillionaire, but that was from the toys. And then he lost that deal when he hit that guy with the baseball bats and he lost all his money from Kenner. But early days UFC, nothing like now, right? With the money? Yeah, it's growing, growing. It's not quite boxing yet, but it's it's getting there. And with Evil Knievel, did my dad was never around. He'd come around once every now and then, once every couple of years. And once he came down for my birthday and he took me to Montgomery Ward, which is like an old school Walmart. I know it. And he said, and he said, he was always cool. Like when he saw me, he was never addicted to me. My, my, my real dad was never addicted to me. I just never saw him. And when he saw me, he'd give me like a hundred bucks or whatever. He would like take me to movies with all my friends. Or like Disney guilt money. Here's some, here, yeah. daddy loves yeah. you. Here's an evil Knievel doll. <laughs> so he took me to Montgomery Ward and he said, you could have anything in the store, pick anything. I could have picked, picked a bicycle. I could have, and I got that evil Knievel little, right. uh, where he's on a, a motorcycle and he jumps off a ramp and you're like, you press something, he goes, boom. Remember yeah. that shit? Oh yeah, the 19, wind down. Like 19, like 79 or something. And that, that's all I wanted. I just wanted evil fucking Knievel. They make that right now again, dude. Oh shit! <laughs> I got it. In, I got it in my house. Really? There's oh, you a, were a big dude. His story is amazing. Like if you oh, his documentary. Great. Yeah. Oh like, man, he was yeah. just. They were telling him, "Don't fucking jump again." His body was broken in all sorts of pieces, and like doctors were constantly putting him together. And like he needed money, dog. He, he had it because I need to. I need to pay the bills. I got to jump over this fucking hotel. I know, you know, um, what's his name made that uh, fucking jackass. Uh, he made that documentary, um, Johnny Knoxville. Knoxville? Yeah. Wow. And that makes sense. That makes sense to blow that guy up based on what they do, you know? Yeah, right. Because, you know, they're fucking, I mean, Evil Knievel inspired everything there is about stunts and X Games and jumping and shit. The shit that they're doing right now, dude. I watch people on motorcycles and bicycles and I don't even, and, and, and the fucking, um, and the, uh, the snowmobiles, these fucking guys are doing somersaults on snowmobiles and shit. It's nuts, dude. Yeah. In the eighties, you couldn't, you couldn't jump and flip. They didn't figure that out in the eighties. I came, I came early nineties. We're like they, they were like now they just do insane stuff that was never thought possible. Were you a BMX guy? Because I was a huge BMX guy. I was a huge BMX guy, but I grew up in a poor Mexican neighborhood, so I never we never had the right bikes. You know what I mean? I had like a I had a, a mongoose a ripoff called uh, Ross. It was a Ross bike, a real heavy piece of shit. You could buy it at Gemco, but we didn't have any money, but. We would go and we would build like, you know, uh, BMX tracks, like in an empty lot, just shitty. And we would wreck and I'd shit my pants and we would wreck. And then, but we would go to uh, in Orange, Orange, California. There was like a legit BMX track with all the rich white people when they take their kids. And we would just sit there and watch and, and hope one day we'd have enough money to, to do what they're doing. But we never did. <laughs> Some of the best fucking BMX tracks <clears throat> were in California, you know, you had Saddle Ranch, uh, Saddleback, sorry, Saddleback, which is down here in SoCal where they had the big championships and, and you know, tracks all over California. Every Sunday or Saturday, I'd be out racing, man, when I was a kid. And it was just incredible how fun that shit was, man. BMX and early skateboard parks were just so fucking nutty and cool, man. Yeah, I didn't have the balls to do skateboard shit. I would ride a skateboard, but like on my knee. I was one of those guys. I'd be on one knee and then with the other leg pushing. I never had, uh, I, I never had courage when it came to jumps with skateboards or even like snowboarding. I snowboard, but I don't. I never jump. I never. But I love snowboarding, but I never ever even want to jump. It's, it seems so scary to me. When I was a kid, when, not a kid, but when I was young and that UFC first came out, I remember, you know, I bought the black box cable box from a neighbor who made them and I'd watch them all, you know, and um, at the at the beginning, am, am I right on this in, in my memory? There was no weight limits or rules, right? You just a big guy against a small guy, whatever. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. No weight limits. There was no weight divisions. Uh, there were rules like you couldn't eye gouge, you couldn't bite. Right. And uh, and that was pretty much it, eye gouging and biting, because in the beginning, they didn't say you can't hit the balls. And there's a there's a match, a famous uh, historic match between Keith Hackney and Joe Song. This is like, I think UFC maybe four or three. And dude, he was just like wailing him in the balls. He had him on the ground and he was just like, wow, wow, hitting him in the balls over and over. I think he had a cup, but it's still not going to feel good. <laughs> I got some old VHS tapes sitting here in my box still of UFC, like one, two, three, four, because I would tape them and then we just watch them on weekends when we were fucking partying. <laughs> I, I took UFC one through eight and put it on an eight hour VHS tape, all edited without just the fights and the tail of the tape, none of the bullshit in between. And that would last eight hours. And I uh, DJed at a strip club. And on Fridays, it was Friday day, I worked 11 to seven on Fridays. And at this strip club, they would have a big screen too. Like a lot of big strip clubs will have a big screen, like a, like a sports bar kind of thing. And they would just leave ESPN Sports Center on there all day, generally. It'd be, it'd be golf or whatever. But on Fridays, I would bring my tape in and we'd have a VCR and it was plugged into the big screen. And it would take the whole shift to get through the whole tape. And that was like the, the most... Uh, fun I would have working at the strip club while we had UFC one through eight on big screen. Girls would complain because guys were watching that go, what the fuck is going on? Because those early fights had brutality. People were oh. getting fucked. Dude, oh. that shit, that shit was fucking tough to watch, man. It was like yeah. full street fighting, man. And they didn't even have the gloves, right? They just had the tape. Just bare knuckle. Yeah, Some, a couple a couple guys wore gloves. Like I think Tank Tank Abbott was really the first one to wear like MMA style gloves. He came in like, but uh, you didn't have to. You could just fight bare knuckle. And in the first UFC, there was a boxer named Art Jimerson, and he came in with one boxing glove in one hand and the other hand no glove, and he, he went against Hoist Gracie, and that one went really quick. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because you quick. have your hand. You need one of your hands, you know, to like pull yeah. shit off. Yeah, yeah. He wore a full blown boxing. Where, where, hand. where are some of these guys? I know Gracie and his whole family is still, and and which, by the way, is amazing that later on you ended up fighting him and beating him and shit, which is wild. But where is people like uh, Ken Shamrock? Where are those guys? Uh. I don't know exactly, but most of the guys probably have a gym that they run. You know, that, that that's the smartest thing to do. If you have um, a reputation for being an ultimate fighter, uh, you might want to open up a gym. You know, it's uh, that's probably the best way to keep the money coming in, you know, uh, having a gym and, you know, membership and auto pay and every right. month everyone gets it's a good business, you know? So if they're not doing that, I think it's a mistake. I think after you retire from fighting, even today, open up a gym, get, you know, 300, 400 members that are on auto pay, man. Yeah. Easy, easy money. Yeah. Cause most of those people don't show up, which is amazing. And then they, <laughs> just, they just let the shit keep going. It's amazing how people will go. I signed up for a gym. I don't really go. And it's just click, 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 click yeah. on their fucking account, man. It is fucking wild. That is the ultimate lazy American that won't even go down and cancel their gym membership. That is because they feel guilty. They feel because they feel like, oh, I'll come back. Oh, I'll come back. I don't want to be a quitter. Yeah, totally. And it's all for all gyms, too, not just martial arts gyms or oh, no, that's what I'm saying. All gyms. Yeah, yeah, all gyms, same thing. You sign up, auto pay. It's a great business. You know, I, I used to think like, wow, look at these guys opening up these little gyms. Like, why would you open up a little gym when there's 24 hour fitness everywhere and planet fitness everywhere? But if you got a gym and you got 200 students, two, 300, you're good. You're good. 
You don't oh, have yeah. nothing to worry about. Really. So I, I get it now. All these little gyms, I like, I get it. <laughs> it's funny because you had UFC. It kind of came out of the box red hot. And at the same time, you had the phenomenon of uh, Mike Tyson, which was also really fucking next level. And what I really uh, noticed in my lifetime, I'm 57, growing up with some of the greatest, uh, you know, heavyweight champions of the world and, and all of those great, great fights, Rumble in the Jungle. And even uh, back when the heavyweights went 15 rounds and it was a true fucking battle, it seems to me now that I don't hear nothing about boxing at all anymore. Now, look, I'm not in the world of that, but my point was back in the day, everyone knew about boxing. Even if you weren't a fan, it was like wide world of sports is going to show Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier. Holy shit. Let's fucking watch this. And the planet watched it, but you don't hear about boxing like that anymore. Yeah. Back in the day before the UFC boxing was the, like the ultimate mono and a mono sport like whether you were into a football like maybe you were a hockey fanatic or a baseball fanatic or you, you were all in on basketball or maybe multiple sports um whatever you were into everybody united with boxing like a mike tyson was gonna fight all the hockey fans the basketball fans baseball fans football fans they all got together and they they watched mike fucking tyson you know those were the days and then the ufc kind of um, put a dent into that but it was also because like after Mike Tyson the heavyweight division kind of went to shit little by little you know we had Riddick Bo we had Lennox right. Lewis but after those guys um, were gone the heavyweight division kind of just dissipated but now now the heavyweight division is pretty strong in boxing I mean you got Tyson Fury you got the Bronx Bomber you got the um uh, the Mexican guy, Ruiz. There's some guys now. Now, all of a sudden, the heavyweight division looks uh, entertaining. I'll watch it. You know what I mean? I mean, I'll watch boxing if it's a big name. Like, if it's Canelo or something, um, I'll watch that. But um, once once I got into the UFC, I pretty boxing pretty much ended for me as far as being a fanatic. Like, I used to be a boxing fanatic. I, I would have every boxing magazine every month. I would study the top 10 in every division. I would know their records. I was a boxing freak. I would watch anything boxing. Tuesday night fights on ESPN, Friday night fights. Like I was a boxing fanatic until I saw the UFC. I'm like, oh my God, I'm, in, I'm into the wrong sport. So then I got 100% into UFC and kind of left boxing um, in the dust. I'll still watch it though every now and then. I mean, yeah, that fucking 70s boxing was ever. Remember Cooney? Remember him? Hell yeah, that was great white hope. Yeah, Jerry Cooney. Yeah, I met him at um at Sirius XM about five years ago, man. He was so fucking cool. I think he has a show on uh XM radio, but there he was in the hall, man. He was like, ah. And I talked to him for a while. When I started comedy, I used to have a bit about how uh kung fu was fake, you know. I'd be like, oh, Hey man, I've seen a million bar fights. I never seen a guy whip out Kung Fu, you know, like the actual Kung Fu you want to see of like nunchucks, some fucking ninja stars and some full blown Bruce Lee shit, you know? And uh, it was funny because I always thought if somebody was badass at Kung Fu, couldn't they just beat everybody in UFC, but then it got into that grappling, you know, and everybody was into grappling. And I was like, ah, I want to see two Kung Fu guys go. Cause I love kicks and, you know, flying shit, you know? Yeah. And well, what we learned um, through years of the UFC and, and uh, after analyzing all the data, uh, Kung Fu, all that works. But it just didn't work in the beginning because most Kung Fu guys didn't have any kind of takedown defense and they had no jujitsu. So a Kung Fu, Taekwondo, karate, all that shit works. But you got to have wrestling and jujitsu with it. Then it works really good. But if you just have Taekwondo, no wrestling, no jujitsu, uh, unless you land one or that one punch you throw, you're probably going to get taken down and choked out. 
but it does work. We like now, like we're seeing, we're seeing all sorts of Kung Fu kicks work now. Well, that, there's never, ever, ever a better ending to a UFC ever than when a guy does a fucking kick to the head and the guy's done. Because the grappling and the guy tapping out, you're like, ah, to me, it's a lot like NFL when they run the ball. I'm like, in the fourth quarter of the NFL, it should only be passing. That should be the rule for now on. And I think in the UFC, in the second period, you know, whatever, the second round, if they make it to the second round, it has to be only up on your feet. No takedowns, meaning kicks and roundhouses and punches and all of that. You know what I mean? So you get these different styles of fighting each round. Yeah, yeah, but then we've already had that. We've always had that. We've had kickboxing and Muay Thai has always been around and you could do all that shit and kickboxing right. and Taekwondo and we've always had that. Um, so like to watch MMA and say, man, I wish they would just stay on their feet. Go watch kickboxing. They do that shit. They can't even go on the ground. They're not even allowed to go on the ground. So you should be really happy. The UFC is about uh, as it's it's about as being as real as possible. It's the most realistic form of uh, competition in regards to fighting and martial arts. Right. So I mean, it's still not a street fight. You still got rules. You can't eye gouge. You can't bite. They still got rules, but. It's as close to a street fight as you can get. I mean, there's guys out there that say, oh, it's not a street fight, you know, there's no cave, there's no ref in, in the streets. Yeah, okay, but if you were gonna get in a street fight, wouldn't you want John Jones as your right hand fucking man or anybody in the UFC, any like average UFC fight? Like you were like, okay, I want that dude as my yeah. right hand man. Because even though it's not technically street fighting, it's as close as you can get. There's oh, nothing close to the UFC to street fighting. So, yes, it's different. Yes, there's no refs on the street. But you take any any average UFC fight, you put them on the street, you're going to fuck up 99.9999% of anybody on the street. And oh, that's yeah. a fact. That's why I always, I always laugh at these fucking... Uh... These internet trolls that think they're badass talking shit, you know, I would love to see them talk shit to people's faces. You know that to me, I wish there was an app where somebody talked shit and then you just instead of DM them, you just pressed it and they were in your living room. And, and they're, oh, yeah. what, what's going on now? <laughs> and like, oh, 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 fucking, I saw some sketch where a guy was talking shit about a boxer. And then they went to his house and knocked on his door and they're like, are you a Jimmy uh, two fist boxing fan? He's all, yep. And then the boxer walks up and just punches him in the face. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, maybe don't talk shit on the internet. I was like, that's amazing. Yeah. People are always going to talk shit on the internet. Oh, yeah. There's always going to be pussies out there. Yeah. Have you seen the telephone booth fighting? Yeah, I've seen a lot of crazy shit. I've seen uh, people fighting in cars with seatbelts on. I've seen uh, five on five in some obstacle course fighting. Oh, to Ru Russians, they don't give a fuck. Russian, there's no regulations there. Or some they have no commissions because they just think of something and they fucking do it. They fight in cars like with seatbelts. <laughs> just fucking like domestic violence. I said, shut up, Tammy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Like they actually have a car in the studio and then they have two dudes fighting. It's wow. crazy. Well, yeah, I was watching some of that telephone booth fighting in London. They're in those red booths and it's like ding, ding. And there's only this fucking far and they are just going at it, man. It is crazy. The world's insane. <laughs> now you got a gym, right? Yes, I have a gym downtown LA, 10th Planet HQ. It's a headquarters. Um, I also uh, license the name 10 Planet. So got about 170 licensees out there uh, spreading the 10th Planet gospel. That's fucking crazy, man. That's great. Like, I mean, you know, like you said, you're out there fighting and stuff and then you start a gym and everything. At what point do you meet Joe Rogan? Do you meet him from where you training him or what? how does that happen? We were both training as pups together. I mean, I met him like 1997, 
Uh, he was a blue belt in jujitsu. I was a purple belt. And we just, um, I was at, I trained at Jean-Jacques Machado Academy. It's in the Valley. And I heard like, I, that uh, there's this guy that was on news radio. He trains here now. It was like 96, 97. And I was after news radio was over. And now he's like downtime. He hasn't got a new job. So he's just like working out. And I heard, and he was getting private. So he was never taking regular classes. He was taking privates. And uh, I heard about it. Oh shit! There's this guy, uh, this actor guy on NBC. He's training at her gym, and then I would like kind of see him in passing, but never really talk to him. And um, and and back in those days, I was a DJ at a strip club, and um, you know, I would take dates strippers out to the comedy store. We go watch, you know, it's Sunday night open mic back in the day. I don't know, do they still have open mic Sunday nights? I yep, don't know, but yeah, yeah, Sunday Monday, still Sunday uh, night. No, now it's only Monday, but they used to have it Sunday and Monday. Yeah, it, back in the day, back in like 97, 98, 99, 2000, 2001, it was on Sunday. Yeah. And um, and I would take, you know, dates to the comedy store because I, I worship comedy. I love comedy. Richard Pryor, Martin Lawrence, Chris Rock, all those motherfuckers, Sam Kinison. I worship. I, 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 all I would tape on my VCR is boxing, and comedy, anything comedy, like Howard Stern, Comic View, In Living Color, anything that was funny. And um, so I love the comedy store. So I, I took I took a date to uh, an open mic one day and then they introduced Joe Rogan. I'm like, that's that guy that trains with me. Holy shit, he trains at my school. And he crushed, you know, he had, he, he always crushes. And when he got off stage, I kind of went up to the hey, dude, we trained at the same gym, we trained jujitsu. And he was like, Really? What are you trained at John John? I said, Oh shit. So that's when we sat down and really, you know, exchanged numbers. And then we that's the point where we um started hanging out. So it was in the OR at the comedy store in 1997. Yeah, yeah, man. It's that comedy store is just a goddamn mecca, man. It's there, I don't, I really don't think. There's only a few places left in LA that are true Los Angeles. It'd be like the rainbow is true yeah. Los Angeles. The uh, whiskey, Roxy, the Troubadour, 100% LA. Fr uh, Musso and Frank's, LA. The Palladium, LA. When you think yeah. of these, you think about iconic fucking places. And also, I think the biggest, biggest thing to me about the rainbow whiskey and the comedy store is they're family owned, man. They're fucking family owned right now. There's no corporation running these places. You know what I'm saying? They are owned by the same family that started them, which is killer. Yeah. That's crazy. It's so yeah. crazy. You, you would think uh, the comedy store would have got snatched up by, some like Viacom or some shit, you know? Oh, 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 Live Nation or Netflix's comedy store or or they, you know, so, you know, licensed out the name across.